These are Microsoft Zune MP3 players. And they're better than you remember. To understand why and determine the reason that Zune still failed, we have to look at the history. You see, Microsoft is no stranger to supremacy battles. Windows vs. Linux, Xbox vs. PlayStation, Internet Explorer vs. Firefox, Bing vs. Google. These have all been fronts in a war Microsoft has been fighting for decades. But Microsoft's biggest enemy has always been Apple, and they needed a weapon that would do some real damage in that fight. Devising such a weapon wasn't easy because Microsoft is, at its heart, a software company. Apple, on the other hand, leans more towards hardware, which naturally gives them control over the software on their devices. If you remember the old Mac vs. PC ads, John Hodgman wasn't playing a Microsoft computer. He was playing a generic PC. That's because Microsoft didn't manufacture any PCs for Apple to lampoon. So Apple targeted the entire concept of beige PCs that typically ran Windows. Those were manufactured by companies like Gateway, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Dell, Compaq, and e-machines. But Apple expected audiences to associate them with Windows and therefore Microsoft. In 2001, five years before those ads started airing, Apple released their first iPod. By the mid-2000s, the iPod was immensely popular and had played a big role in making Apple hip among the youths. Microsoft saw a chance to strike back against Apple with some hardware of their own. They did so with the 2006 release of the Zoom. Three generations of the Zoom came out over the years, and they were all failures by most metrics. Numbers are hard to find and vary by year and model, but Apple sold at least 40 times more iPods than Microsoft sold Zooms. The actual number is probably more than 100 times as many units sold. But I'm going to explain why everyone was wrong and why the Zoom was actually really good. The first Zoom hit the market a week before my 18th birthday. At the time, I was the kind of obnoxious contrarian that the kids today would probably call it an edgelord. Believe me when I say that, I'm embarrassed to admit that. But the truth was that the Zoom appealed to me because it wasn't an iPod. I also really liked the design of the first generation Zoom, which Microsoft developed with lots of help from Toshiba. Most people refer to this model as the Zoom 30, since it had a capacity of 30 gigabytes on its hard disk. The original price was $250, but that dropped to $200 within a year. For comparison, the standard 30 gigabyte iPod available at the time was $300. So Microsoft was clearly hoping that a lower price would entice customers. And the Zune had a chunky look and feel that was almost antithetical to Apple's sleek products. The case and color design of the first generation Zune is especially interesting. The standard colors were white, black, and brown. But they had a unique double shot plastic case that was somewhat translucent, so it appeared kind of layered. The brown model had a greenish, yellowish translucency, while the black model had a bluish cast to it. And the white model was just clear around the outside. The brown Hershey color is probably the most famous for good reason. It managed to look both modern and retro at the same time. I had the black one back in the day, but bought the iconic brown color for this video. There were also several special edition colors released over the years, but the brown, black, and white are what most of us remember. There was a lock switch on the top, dedicated back and play pause buttons, and a circular control in the center. This isn't a click wheel like on an iPod, it's just a directional pad with a button in the center. The Zoom 30 ran Windows Embedded CE 6.0, which had a nice crisp interface on the 3-inch 320 by 240 pixel color LCD. It also had a Wi-Fi adapter, which allowed for wireless syncing and some unique but kind of pointless social features. It even had a built-in FM radio receiver. But the Zoom's biggest selling point was also its most overlooked, the Zoom Music Pass. Remember that the Zoom came out in 2006, which was long before mobile music streaming was a thing. The idea of using the amount of cellular data necessary to stream music was absurd at the time. But the Zoom Music Pass was a very clever alternative. Like Spotify today, you could pay a monthly subscription fee to gain access to all the music that the service had to offer, and that library was substantial. You could download and listen to as much of that music as you wanted to. All you had to do was sync your Zoom to the Marketplace servers every couple of weeks to maintain your subscription license. That was a very big deal at a time when most people were either purchasing every song individually or pirating their music from services like BearShare. I still remember the jealousy on my friends' faces when I would show them that I could get any song I wanted, complete with album art and metadata that was actually accurate. The gamers watching will recognize the obvious similarity to another of Microsoft's services that would come years later, the Xbox Game Pass. 
That is arguably the biggest advantage of choosing an Xbox over a PlayStation. The Zune Music Pass should have given the Zune a similar advantage against the iPod, but I think Microsoft failed to market the service properly and people simply weren't aware of it. There were also cool features for downloading and syncing podcasts. Once again, we take that for granted these days with our smartphones and unlimited 5G LTE data plans, but back then it felt like magic to be able to plug your Zune in and automatically get all of your podcasts for the week. Then disaster struck on New Year's Eve 2008. Thanks to a software error and a third-party driver, the date change caused many Zunes around the world to freeze up. The issue was poor programming that failed to account for the fact that 2008 was a leap year with 366 days. The result was a death loop that continued throughout the day. Even Microsoft's official fix was to simply let the Zune drain its battery, then recharge and restart the next day. That certainly didn't help the Zune's reputation, but the truth is that it wasn't doing very well anyway. I'm no audiophile and I can't comment on how the audio quality stacks up, but the Zune failed to compete with the iPod in more important ways. At the time of the first Zune's release, there were iPod models available with much larger capacities for the people with massive music collections. There was also the iPod Mini, iPod Nano, and iPod Shuffle for those who cared more about cost and size. And more importantly, the iPod was simply cooler in the eyes of the public. A public that is famously wrong about half the time. To most people, the Zune was little more than a knockoff iPod. It was held in more esteem than devices like the Rio MP3 players, which were considered borderline generic products. But Apple was very much a premium brand according to the public opinion of the time, and Microsoft couldn't reach that same status with the Zune. Microsoft tried to address some of these issues with the release of the second generation Zune in 2007. The Zune 80 and Zune 120 had larger capacity hard disk drives while still being smaller and lighter than the first generation. The Zune 4, Zune 8, and Zune 16 models were much smaller, closer to like an iPod Nano in size, and utilized flash storage. Both models got the new Squircle combination touchpad and directional pad, which was an obvious attempt at replicating Apple's click wheel magic. They also retained the FM tuner, the social features, and the Zune Music Pass functionality. This is a Zune 4 gigabyte, so the smaller of the two variants for this generation. This one doesn't turn on, sadly, so I can't show you the interface, but I wanted you to be able to at least see the form factor and design. I didn't own one of these when they were new and only bought this one for this video. From what I can gather, the interface is almost exactly the same as the first generation, but though it received better reviews than the first generation, it also failed to capture any significant portion of Apple's market share. Microsoft's final attempt would come in 2009 with the release of the third generation, the Zune HD, available in 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, and eventually 64 gigabytes of flash storage. This was a model that I owned back in the day and I adored it. It was a clear attempt to compete with the iPod Touch and Microsoft was trying desperately to replicate some of Apple's premium appeal. In my opinion, they achieved that and they did it in a number of ways. First up was the aluminum enclosure. It was available with either black or platinum accents. Next was the touchscreen, which had an OLED screen with an eye-popping 480 by 272 pixel resolution. That was helped by powerful hardware, including the highly touted NVIDIA Tegra APX2600 processor and 128 megabytes of SD RAM. Even the radio got an upgrade to an HD tuner. The boosted performance of the Zune HD enabled a dramatically improved interface. I think this holds up even to modern standards. It's smooth and responsive with nice UI elements. This is the first example that I remember of Microsoft putting its Metro design language into use. MDL emphasized typography and clean graphic design that embraced its digital nature rather than attempting to mimic real world materials like glass or brushed aluminum. I found it really appealing and it had included some neat effects on the Zune HD. For example, you would get cool animations of the album art, song title, and so on while playing your music. You would get to see those in glorious high definition 720p on your TV if you plugged in your Zune into a dock. I made heavy use of that feature and remember being very proud to show off the cool animations during parties, but even those premium touches couldn't save the Zune. However, we can hardly blame Microsoft for that. Apple's own success with the iPhone was killing the entire MP3 player industry. Most consumers were perfectly happy to use their smartphones for their music and didn't want to carry around an iPod or Zune if they didn't have to. It wasn't long until cellular plans with lots of data came along, and that paved the way for widespread adoption of music streaming services like Spotify. In June of 2012, Microsoft officially killed the Zoom. 
it wasn't a coincidence that that occurred just after the release of the Windows Phone, which was Microsoft's new chosen arena in the fight against Apple. But that's a subject for an upcoming video. Since then, the Zune has become something of a joke in popular culture, at least among the people who even know what a Zune is, but it also has a cult following. When I was searching eBay for Zunes to buy for this video, I kept coming across references to Star-Lord. I'm not a big MCU guy, so I didn't know that Star-Lord himself acquired a Zune in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Apparently that was played off as a gag, poking fun at the Zune's second-rate status in history, but ironically it drove up prices of Zunes, especially first-generation models in Hershey Brown. The same thing happened with Sony Walkman after the first movie. There are also those of us that owned Zunes when they were still new and that feel a lot of nostalgia for them. That feeling is what drove me to buy the same models I owned back then. And while nostalgia can be toxic, that doesn't mean that the Zune has nothing to offer today. But before we get to that, let me tell you about this video's sponsor, PCBWay. If you're still fumbling with homemade PCBs or trying to shove strip boards into your projects, then you're way behind the times, my friend. You can get much more reliable, easier to assemble, and professional looking PCBs by ordering them through PCBWay. The ordering process is really simple once you've designed your PCB in software like KiCad, and the prices are very affordable. Seriously, there is no reason to deal with the frustration of making your own PCBs anymore. If you want to give that a try, use the link in the description for a $5 credit towards your first order. Thanks for listening to that message. Now back to the Zune's place in the modern world. Microsoft shut down its servers a long time ago, but dedicated fans have replicated them to keep some functions, like device updates, working. Thanks to their work, I was able to reset and update my Zunes and get music onto them using my Windows 11 PC. There's also an active modding scene. Mad Mod Labs, here on YouTube, upgraded a first-generation Zune to give it Bluetooth, 128 gigabytes of SSD storage, a new 3000 milliamp hour battery, and wireless QI charging. For people who want a dedicated music player, that looks like a really attractive option. Heck, I'm considering doing something similar, and I don't even have a use for it since I subscribe to Spotify like everyone else these days. But why did the Zune fail, and was it better than iPods available at the time? Well, I think it failed for two reasons. The first was that Apple was simply unstoppable at the time. In the late 2000s, Apple was in its prime and near the peak of its popularity. For those of you who are too young to remember, it's hard to overstate Apple's status in those years. In my opinion, this was the result of literal decades of groundwork on Apple's part, and it owes a lot of that to their education programs. Throughout the 80s, 90s, and into the new millennium, Apple had programs to donate their computers to schools, or at least sell them at a very steep discount. I was born in 1988, and my family's first computer was an Apple IIc, which my dad bought because he used Apple computers in college in the 80s. Throughout elementary school and middle school, I used various Macintosh models in my computer classes, as did almost everyone else in my generation. Ask anyone in their 30s and they'll regale you with tales of playing Oregon Trail and of their hands cramping on the stupid circular puck mouse that came with iMac G3 computers. Through those education programs, Apple bred familiarity and a sense of comfort. Then Steve Jobs unleashed Johnny Ive, whose industrial design style was perfect for the era, Ive, who was heavily influenced by minimalist designers like Dieter Rams, was responsible for the clean design of the iPod and Apple's other products for many years. This really was a masterclass in building a brand. Meanwhile, Microsoft was seen as boring. Most people did use Microsoft products, but nobody was passionate about them. Those Mac vs. PC commercials really did nail the prevailing sentiment and hammer it home. The second big problem was Microsoft's inability to innovate in any meaningful way. I've already spoken about the benefits of the Zune Music Pass, but Microsoft didn't do a good job of making those benefits clear to consumers. I can't recall if I even knew about them when I bought my first Zune. Other than the Music Pass, the Zune didn't have any killer features to set it apart from the iPod. I'm not sure what Microsoft could have done to achieve that, but they clearly needed to do something to pull customers away from Apple's immense gravity. Almost all of my friends at the time owned iPods, and it would have required something big to get them to switch. Microsoft completely failed to provide that, and so the Zune was seen as a fringe alternative. It's similar to how most people see Bing today in comparison to Google. Yeah, it does some of the same stuff, but it doesn't do any of it better enough to convince people to switch. Though even that analogy isn't quite right, since few people today think of Google as cool. But that was most definitely how most people saw Apple during the iPod's reign. And that brings us back to the big question. Was the Zoom better than the iPod? 
it hurts to say this, but the answer is mostly no. I think the hardware is just as good, at least to my non-audiophile ears. Looking at reviews and analyses from the time, it seems that the general consensus was that the Yazoon's audio quality was on par with iPods, and on a subjective level, I prefer the Zune design and interface. I also think that the Zune Music Pass was an amazing feature that made the Zune very desirable for people that hadn't already purchased their music. But I can't honestly say that the Zune was better. I do, however, genuinely believe that it got a bad rap that it didn't deserve. Zunes were decent products that were comparable to iPods in most respects, but with the benefit of the Zune Music Pass. Public opinion about the Zune seems to be a result of great marketing on Apple's part and poor marketing on Microsoft's part. Consumers rarely make decisions based on purely objective reasoning. We're emotional and social creatures that base our opinions on whatever flimsy rationalizations resonate with us. In my opinion, Zune was and still is pretty awesome. I have very fond memories of using Zune devices throughout my early adulthood and don't recall ever being dissatisfied. But what about you? Did you own a Zune or did you hate them? Do you even remember them? Let us know in the comments and thanks for watching.